The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. Put your money to work by automating your savings and investments. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash save and invest. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. I think you should do the voice. Okay, let's see. This summer, the yes. Team Never Quit podcast. There. Right? <laughs> when do you agree with that? I mean, he kind of he he sits on. He's got a multiple, right? And he yeah, won't yeah. get one of those little boards <laughs> that has the sound effects that I want. So I expect that the voice. Right. Roger that. Welcome back, guys. Uh, pumped to be here. Excited. It's a good Tuesday. It's a little chilly out. We're getting another little cold snap. That's okay. But let's kick this thing off with our icebreaker. It's Monday. Oh, it's Monday. Oh, well, see, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at in the week. What day did he say? <laughs> Tuesday. Tuesday. Well, always looking ahead. Always <laughs> looking ahead. Squared away, bro. That's right. Squared away. All right, here goes the here goes the question. We've got what has been your hardest physical challenge? Your hardest physical challenge. Giving birth. Childbirth. <laughs> that's not really fair. That's when you got ladies in the room, I mean, I, anything we would say would. Just immediately like fail in small. comparison, and I've been cut in half for God's sakes, and I would still not even cop to yeah. any kind of pain standard. Giving birth with the woman sure. in the room, yeah. two of them by chance. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna well, just gonna you lose. <laughs> I'll stay out of that question. Yeah, oh, I mean, I don't think you can say anything. Although Marcus did his last back surgery, they cut him through his belly and his back and they put the clamp on both sides God, that it was, was awesome that was pretty rough but yeah around his spine nothing yeah no i mean i watched i've, I've watched childbirth go, go down and, and, and man mm-mm. yeah that was tough <laughs> angela same same huh oh absolutely. they said at the same time i know that's <laughs> just not right yeah yeah <laughs> oh my gosh mine is just losing weight i know that is not at all comparable but from a physical challenge perspective, just that freaking up and down game of trying, like from getting stupid fat to like losing it all to putting it back on, like that's a tough physical challenge. But I think it's probably more mental than physical. Uh, so sure, because everyone always starts like, I want to lose ten pounds, I want to lose fifteen. That's impossible, man. You yeah. can't lose fifteen pounds at once. Yeah, yeah. not at you once. Lose one pound. <laughs> yeah, one, at one once. damn pound. <laughs> yeah, and see if you can keep that sucker off the scale for a week. Yep. One. Anybody can do one. I mean, your body fluctuates a pound throughout the day. So just think about it like that. And then one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four. And as opposed to stacking all that weight on you, man, it's not, that's, whoever trains people like that screwed that up a long time ago. Fair. In my my perspective. Well, let's just go back to 19 hours of childbirth. (laughs) (laughs) Man, I was commenting on that, dude. I guess you you can lose 15 pounds at once. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) there it is. Well, that was. Real rough. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, baby diet. Mm-hmm. Great question. If you haven't already, make sure you check out our community, teamneverquit.com slash community. You can check out everything we've got going on. We've got some great behind the scenes content. We've got some great swag uh, and just a great place for all of our Team Never Quit listeners to come together, support each other and whatever they're trying to work on. Y'all make sure to check that out. We've got a great guest in store. Angela Rose is an author, a professional speaker, a national advocate, a real estate professional, and she's passionate about helping people triumph over tragedy. Welcome to the show, Angela. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. You bet. Thank you again for doing this. I, um, like I said, we have a file on you and your your life has been anything short of amazing. I know there's some trials in it. We can't wait to hear about it. So please, let, let's start off about, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and then where the, how this all started. Sure. So, you know, I think for me, I always like to, whenever we do speeches through PAVE, it's like personalize ourselves as people before our survivor story, right? So I've got two small kids. I'm married to an amazing man, married my best friend. I love to play guitar. I love to sing. Music has been a really great outlet for me in my life. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important, this message like you, Marcus, is letting people know that there is joy after trauma and pain and a happy, joyful life is absolutely possible. And so with a lot of that is because of support, which I'll talk about. So, you know, I kind of, my life was catapulted into the life of activist when I was 17 years old. And uh, I've never looked back. That was 25 years ago and have been able to build a nonprofit that's now multinational and just helping people realize 
that there is no shame in being a survivor of trauma. Well, uh, absolutely not. That's how everybody survives down here. That's right. <laughs> they look to one of them. Even if they don't talk to them, they look to them. But like, man, I, I mean, I have trouble like you can't believe. Uh, same with all of us. And there's got to be somebody you look to. 100%. Right. You said it happened when you were 17. Before that, it's a two-part question. A lot of people ask, like, so is there a moment? Like, is there a moment, like, when you switch over to something happen to you? And I, I was like, yeah, it, it, for, for some of us, it rolls like that. However, the moment can last for a little while. And that just kind of, it's, it's like strengthening the, the person you're going to become, so to speak. So if you want to yeah. talk about that for, if you will. Yeah, did you yeah, grow absolutely. up in Chicago? So I've always been, you know, pretty outgoing. I was a homecoming queen my senior year of high school. And I, you know, just really loved life. And I remember very vividly working at a shopping mall. And, you know, it was it was a broad daylight when I was kidnapped at knife point. And I always like to start by saying whenever we speak as well, that this is a safe space, because undoubtedly, Marcus, there's some of your listeners that have experienced some type of personal trauma. There's so many people that have experienced sexual abuse and assault. So I always like to say that, that you know, trigger warning that this is a safe space. And we know that there's so many women and men who have experienced sexual abuse or trauma in their lives. So, um, you know, so with my story, I think what really fueled my activism was not just the experience of being kidnapped, but I went down to the police station after he finally let me go after several hours and the detective didn't believe me and accused me of lying. Oh my gosh. And there was nothing done on my case that night. And so I think so much of that hurt that I had experienced and the trauma was immediately replaced with anger because I couldn't believe sure. that there was nothing done. They didn't take any evidence The where he had bound my wrist behind my back. He, there, my arms were so lacerated he used uh, plastic zip ties to bow my hands behind my back. And when they took the pictures, the Polaroid pictures, they were so overexposed that they couldn't even use them in court. It was a Polaroid camera. Oh like gosh. clearly they knew um, they didn't take my clothes that night for evidence. So it took a lot of my family coming together to put so much pressure on the police station. They finally put two new detectives on the case that were amazing and said they would do everything they can to catch this man, which they did. And it turned out that he not only was on parole for all these different crimes, he was on parole for murdering a 15 year old girl who oh looked gosh. very similar to me long blonde hair similar facial features and we found out later that he had stalked me and he was watching me at the mall okay. so let's take I it back like let's let's go back uh, let's start from before that where were you living give us a little bit about uh, i want to hear this story like in full detail as if it's a movie so sure. give me give me the, the this, this is a crazy story so let's go back a little bit and then like go to that day yeah so i was i grew up in a suburb of chicago um you know middle class had two younger sisters i was the oldest of three girls my italian father uh, he, i had the earliest curfew out of any of my girlfriends and uh, had a little <laughs> oh so pure italian i can hear yeah. the like italian. dark hair yeah yeah i can hear that i a can hear bit. a little italian accent <laughs> but the blonde hair is a swedish the dark eyes is I, right right yeah. so you're a splice you're a hybrid right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I had the earliest curfew, and uh, but I did have a little adventurous streak in me. So I borrowed my parents' car when I was 16 and drove to Memphis, Tennessee oh, with wow. my friend and stayed at the Admiral Benbow Inn for 19.95 a night. <laughs> and uh, just love adventure, love road trips and um, you know, love music and things like that. So. <laughs> oh, how fun. So did you get the car back without dad knowing? Well, I, this is, I know it's hard for people to imagine a time before cell phones, but there was such a time. Right, and right. That was me in 1996 when this happened. Uh, so I actually was standing in front of uh, Graceland and I called my mom from a payphone, and I said, mom, I'm standing at the gates of Graceland. Isn't this great? Thinking she would love the adventure. And uh, my, my dad found out I was grounded for, don't remember how long, but quite a long time. Until yesterday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I actually did that. I didn't go that far. I that's, did a three-hour drive. That must be a daughter drive. thing. I, I, that, that's the thing. I was too scared to death. Did, did you ever yeah, no, snatch your old man's no, truck no or way. anything like that? No way, right? Because no. he'd kill us. Yeah, yeah. Death. <laughs> death. Death. Murder, <laughs> murder, death. death, kill. Yeah. yeah, I did that when I was 16. I actually had my own car, but it was before cell phones. And I told my mom, actually, I'm giving myself away because I still have never told her this. <laughs> oh, but, God. Here um, goes. I should have listened to this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I told her that I was going to a friend's house to spend the night, and I drove three hours away to Abilene um, to a college town and spent the night there, and then woke up at like five in the morning and drove home. Yeah, before cell phones. That was a big deal. 
<laughs> that was crazy. Anyway. That's we, a good story. I get the I get the uh adventurous spirit. And yeah. you were never busted. You never were Never caught, were busted, you? no. Nice. Actually, <laughs> like the only bad things I did in high school, I've never been busted on. So that oh, is that'll amazing. definitely come back to haunt with the daughter. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> like, like, I'll have to deal with that. That's how that works. There are cell phones now. Yeah. God. And damn, there's cell phones and cameras everywhere. Trackers. We will track tracking device. Tracking device. Right. Yeah, yeah low jacks. I mean, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm wired up from the head down, phones, truck. I'm over it. I know I, that, and I get watched all the time. Freaking daughter, man. The young ones, especially the COVID babies, they're, they're like tech ninjas. They, they can get right. around it. You know what I'm talking about? They, they know all. Being born into something is different than being a, adopted by it and being consumed by it. Yeah. So. That's true. Oh, my gosh. How about okay. that? Huh? Like I, I mean, we're talking about a different class of people. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're, we're the middle. We're the, the center of the hourglass, I like to say, the splices. Because we, we right. can deal with the old. Like, if you took it away from us, we'd be fine. We can still live. Yeah, it'd go back to the way it was. Phones on, you got a cord to it, attached to the house kind of deal. It's like <laughs> yes. our own little leashes. <laughs> but uh, uh, these kids, what is it? Something the other day, I was talking to my daughter about it, and uh, the minute I was like, "Well, I'll, I'll take that iPad from you," you could—that's that was an all stop right there. She was like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> Not anything else? Food, water, shelter? Just it was, it was funny." <laughs> How old is your daughter? She's nine. Nine gotcha. going on eighteen. She's nine. nine. Yeah, we're just starting the journey. <laughs> I have a two-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter, so we've got a little bit of time before that, but yeah. Aww. coming. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you're adventurous in high school, and then yeah, but I did a lot of theater in high school. So wasn't much of a sports girl, but um, definitely loved theater and all that kind of stuff. I think that really prepared me for doing, you know, speaking in front of the larger audiences that I've spoken to in the last 25 years. So I think that God always has a plan for certain things, and so yeah just uh, was working at this little baby's clothes store. It was very cute. It was a big mall outside Chicago called Woodfield Mall. And so we, I worked at this boutique baby's clothes store. So I would make these giant baby baskets. People would come in for their upcoming baby showers and things. And so I'd stuff all the little clothes and make these beautiful baby baskets. So that was fun. And I was really excited. I was gonna go to Illinois State University. I wound up not going there because of what happened to me, but was really excited to start college and um, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. And so for those of you who don't know your story at all, what give us like the day of that morning, what happened? Sure. So that morning I was getting ready and I was going to a graduation party actually for my friends because I had just graduated a couple weeks before from high school. And so I had my little striped suit. I like to pretend like I was, you know, very professional at the age of 17 working at the store. So I had my my professional clothes on and then I packed a little bag with the, the fun clothes I was going to change into and said goodbye to my family, I told my mom that I was going to be going to a graduation party. When I got to work, I asked my boss if I could leave about 30 minutes early from work and she said yes and I was very excited. This was a Saturday? It was a Saturday, yep. Mm -hmm. It was a Saturday and yeah. And you, you know, usually honestly at night, if we were leaving really late at night because the employees had to park in a separate lot kind of apart from where the shoppers would park from. So a lot of times we would leave with each other. You know, if it was really late, sometimes we'd have mall security walk us out, but it was broad daylight. It was July 13th of 1996 and the sun was shining and it was about six o'clock when I left my job. Oh, wow. Okay, and then what happened? So then I'm walking towards my car and you know that spidey sense? I'm sure yeah. you would probably understand women have yeah. that problem. I mean, I guess everybody has it. Yeah. Human beings are, are graced with that spidey sense. But mm -hmm. I felt like something was wrong. And I, as I mentioned before, I love music. So I had a Natalie Merchant CD in my hand. I'm singing out loud as I'm walking towards my car. And something just stops me in my tracks. And I look behind me. And about 10 feet behind me, there's somebody following me. Mm. And there was nobody else around. And that spidey sense, you know, that's that feeling in the pit of your stomach where you just feel like you should run or feel like you should get away. And I just didn't listen. I think for so many young women we're taught to, you know, from a gender stereotype perspective, like not make a big deal. I didn't want to make this man feel bad. I didn't want to run away if there was nothing to be afraid of, but you just, I had that sense that something was wrong. And it was dark. And so just a couple minutes later, all of a sudden I was putting my key into the lock and he grabbed me from behind and put a knife to my throat. And he had tried to force me into my car, 
But what really shook me, of course, was everything that was happening, but his car was parked right by my car. So, you know, like if you mm-hmm. take a right into a parking spot, you can take the left into a parking spot. So his car was parked right across from my car. And uh, I didn't realize at that time that he had been following me, but it just seemed so surreal and everything was like an out of body experience. But I will say faith is a huge part of my life. And I did, it wasn't like an audible hearing, but it was, it was a voice. And it said, if, you know, this is basically a part of your journey and that everything's going to be okay. And I know that's strange. I mean, I don't talk about that a lot during my speeches, but I know faith is important to you all. So mm-hmm. that's something that I wanted to share, but it was this feeling. And so he ended up throwing me into the backseat of his car. He had a two door Trans Am, pretty beat up Trans Am. And he had put band-aids over my eyes so I couldn't see. And he didn't know that I could see, but I could see down to either side. And I remember in that car thinking to myself, if I get out of this alive, he is not going to get away with it. Mm. So it was a very conscious decision that I made in that car to remember everything that I could, details about his car. I remember the city sticker on the windshield of his car, his beaded seat cushion, the clothes that he was wearing. I just tried to catalog everything that I could. Was he young? And at one point I tried to roll out of the car because I thought, you know, we were still close enough to the shopping mall if I was able to roll out If I broke a leg or an arm, I'd still be able to, you know, be free. And I went to, at that point I had the seatbelt on me and all at one time I tried to undo the seatbelt, you know, to get to the door and he, you know, grabbed me and put the knife to my face and threatened, you know, to cut me. And that was the time that I just lost it. It was, you know, such a, you know, such an overwhelming experience to be 17 and think like, is this it? You know, there's so much you want to experience in life. Is this, the last day of your life. And, you know, I always wanted to be a mom. I always wanted to have kids and, you know, just like, you know, it sounds cheesy, but it's like your life flashes by your eyes is this the last moment. And so, um, then it wasn't, thankfully he wound up, um, kind of securing the bands even tighter behind my back. And, and I kept trying to personalize myself. And that's one of the things that police said, possibly it saved my life. I kept trying to say, you know, my parents are going to be looking for me. You just need to let me go. You know, he asked me what my name was. I asked him what his name was. Of course, he didn't say anything. And, um, you know, his stoic nature was really one of the most haunting things. He had no expression on his face. He was completely stoic and um, wound up sexually assaulting me in a in a forest preserve. And he took my keys and he wiped his fingerprints off my keys and put them back in my purse. And again, I just kept saying, you need to let me go and bring me back to my car. I'm not going to call the police, which of course I knew I was. Um, But that was, again, it's all these clues that I knew he had done this before. I knew that he, this, you know, that I was not his first victim, that, you know, the fact that he was worried about his fingerprints. When he wound up driving me back, he threw me into a stairwell. He used a handkerchief to open the door to the stairwell to throw me in. Again, another clue. He took you back to the mall? Not to the same mall. So it's in the same town. The big shopping mall was called Woodfield and it was the streets of Woodfield. So kind of like an outdoor shopping mall, but he drove up the parking garage um, and he told me to count to 100. But of course I tried to get my eyes free and I wanted to catch his license plate, but he drove away too quick. Let's take a second to thank our sponsors over at Workable. It seems like everywhere I go, there is a now hiring sign. I know a lot of companies out there are just struggling to get the right people for the job. Coffee shops, retail stores, uh, franchise businesses, they just can't keep up with hiring. And Workable helps all types of companies do just that. There are 46% more jobs being posted than before the pandemic, and there are 44% fewer candidates applying to each one. So you need to find the right candidates and hire them fast. And that is where Workable is going to help you out. They accelerate every step of your hiring process from find to hire. Now, when you're looking for the best talent, you are looking to cast the widest net possible and you're going to be able to post your jobs to all of the top job boards, more than 200 in total with just one click. So no manually taking that process and having to go out there and post each job one by one. Workable is going to help you cast that wide net. They help you evaluate and hire quickly with modern tools like video interviews and e-signatures, and they will even help you automate repetitive tasks like scheduling interviews so you can spend your time on what is important and that is making quality hires. So whether you're hiring for your coffee shop or your engineering team, 
Workable is exactly what you need to hire the right people fast. Start hiring today with a risk-free 15-day trial. If you hire during the trial, which many do, it won't cost you a thing. Just go to workable.com to start hiring. That is workable.com. Workable is hiring made easy. Was he young? No, he was in, he was middle age. I mean, he literally looked like a sex offender. I mean, I can. <laughs> it's funny how that happens, right? They look like that. Oh my gosh. So when he was, when you turned around in the parking lot and you saw him, was he wearing, like, was he just dressed normal and he was just following you or was he? He had like disheveled hair, thick coke, like, you know, they have like the thick, thick glasses yeah. and he was wearing a work outfit. So he was wearing uh, green pants, just, um, he worked at i can't remember where he worked but it was uh so just like green work pants a green work shirt and i mean he just literally looked like a like like a sex offender i mean did if, he if work near you thing. no he didn't live near me but we found out that there was reports of him from earlier that day watching me from the second floor the store that i worked in was on the bottom level oh my God. and it was all glass from store you know from kind of like most stores in the mall there's you yeah. know solid glass in the front where you can see through and there's reports of him from that day. And so I actually ended up later on in life writing him a letter in prison because I wanted to know how long had he watched me? Right. Did he know where I lived? If his car was parked so close to mine and he was watching me in the mall, where did he originally see me? Like, right. did he know where my family was? Like, it just was such a, it just makes you feel so vulnerable to think that you were being stalked and you had no idea. I mean, for me, that was a really traumatic part of it is just thinking like just how vulnerable, you know, a person can be without having any idea that I was being watched. Did he answer you? Mm -mm. He never answered nope. your letter. No. And, uh, you know, I was thinking I, one of our board members at the time of PAVE was the executive in charge of production at America's Most Wanted. And so they offered to bring like a profiler with me if I was going to interview him in prison. And I really wanted answers to some of these questions. And then I had to realize, just like I tell a lot of survivors, a lot of times you're going to have a lot of unanswered questions and you just have to make peace with that. You know, there's sometimes no way for you to know. He makes all of his victims change clothes. He made me wear an evening gown that fit me like a glove, which again, so, so crazy. And when they caught him, he had all these women's dresses, the same dress in all these different sizes. And he knew exactly what dress size I was. Again, so creepy. And he was married. He married a woman that he met through a prison pen pal program. And he basically said that he was in for armed robbery when he was in prison. He was only out on parole for six months when he kidnapped me. And I found out that there was many other girls. The first time I ever came forward on the news, I said, I know that I'm not the only person that he's done this to. And four other girls came forward and they were much younger than I was. So who knows the amount of people that this man has hurt in his life. And he was a suspect Gosh. in other murders as well. How long did he have you? It was about four or five hours. And he made you change in the woods? And it was another God moment for me was, you know, here we are pulled over in this forest preserve. There's nobody around. It's getting dark at that point. And I really questioned, do I run? You know, I didn't know where I was, but I, he had undone the seatbelt, obviously, if I was changing clothes. And I thought to myself, you know, this kind of inner dialogue, you know, you get into these moments and you, you are kind of in your brain talking to yourself, trying to figure out what's, what's the right thing to do. And I, really thought to myself, do I run? Do I, do I try? I don't know where I was. And I stayed put in the car. We found out later that um, Julie Angel was murdered when she tried to get away. And so oh. I honestly feel like maybe she was my guardian angel that day. I mean, her last name was Angel. I have felt so close to her since this happened to me. I became very close with her family. And so I never want her memory to be forgotten. She is my angel. And I feel like maybe she helped me through that experience. Oh, oh yeah, that's a real thing. I believe it. Uh, Good. I'm crying now. I'm sorry. Oh, that is tough. You're a powerful woman. Oh, Don't worry. There's special you. places for people like that. We we design them accordingly. <laughs> well, God will take care of him. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not uh, talking about okay. it down here. <laughs> is he still in prison? He is still in prison. And you know, when all this was going on and it took four years for my case to come to trial, which I found very disheartening. You think, you know, if you get a parking ticket, if something happens, you have to pay it within 30 days. So I thought this was gonna be a pretty easy case. We had 
I was able to pick him out of the lineup right away. We had the evidence of, you know, we I did a sketch of his face with the two amazing detectives that were on my case and someone recognized him. So there was just so much of it. We had all of his previous convictions. He had the rap sheet. I mean, it was so cut and dry in my mind, but it took four years to come to trial because one of the reasons was the length of the blade that he used to abduct me in order for it to be a class X felony, which in the state of Illinois is the most severe felony. And so in the state of Illinois, it's three strikes and you're out. So three class X felonies, you're in prison for life. And so we obviously the DA was trying to make sure that he was going to be, you know, charged with a class X felony. Well, the serrated part of the blade was 3.75 inches, though the length of the blade was the four inches that it needed to be a class X felony. But the judge threw that basically threw that charge saying that, well, the serrated part was 3.75. So this technicality, what an and I, I remember thinking to myself as a teenager, like that's, that's a real thing. Inches, I mean, that like, happens ridiculous. up there. That's so dumb. I mean, that, that that comes up for discussion. Yeah, who is that judge? Who's that? Yeah, that right. judge well, needs to be fired. But thankfully, the higher court unanimously reinstated the the charge, so he was able to be charged with those class X felonies. But it, it was just a, you know, I think survivors. It's such an underreported crime. It's so difficult. Things have changed. I'd ever want to discourage people from reporting because certainly we are trying to get the report rates up of you know sexual and domestic violence, but it's very hard to go through the system. And so we, do, I'm very passionate about law enforcement training. We have an amazing training that we do called Inside the Mind of a Survivor that talks about what happens even neurobiologically in the minds of survivors. You know, I'm kind of an anomaly that most survivors don't remember things chronologically. They don't remember those things that happen because of those stress hormones that get released in, you know, the minds and the brains of survivors. And so, you know, again, I think that was a God thing for me. That means you were designed for it. Yeah. Well, you can like remember just, it like that when you're the only one that comes out of something. If you can remember how it went down, that means you were designed for it. Well, like got God. him off the streets. And yeah. that was to me the most important thing, you know, making sure he didn't hurt anybody else. Well, and God told you when it was going down that you were going to be okay. So you, he obviously knew that you were going to catch this guy and you were the one meant, you know, even though you had to go through the horrific trauma, um, you were able to save so many others. And could not have done it without the support. My grandmother and my, my parents were so amazing through this experience. You know, I, now that I'm a mom, I cannot imagine something like that happening to my child. And the fact that my parents just stood by me, were there for me. And, you know, with my Italian father, God rest his soul, dad, he yeah. talked about how, you know, he really wanted to kill this guy. I mean, it was around that time, the movie, A Time to Kill with Matthew McConaughey came out, yeah. right? I don't know if you remember that film, but I remember going to see it at the theaters and him saying, hey, Ange, come downstairs. And he was like, the dad got off on the charges, right? Yeah. I mean, he would go to shooting practice. I mean, it was intense. And so he just, I think as a parent, you know, he just felt so helpless that he had tried his whole life to protect his girls, you know, and this happened. And what I found interesting, it's like, it didn't happen on my road trip to Memphis when I was doing something naughty. It happened when I was like, going to work or, you know, leaving work and all that kind of stuff. So I, you know, it's just interesting the way life happens. I mean, I remember being in Memphis, Tennessee, just, you know, not many, not that long before this happened to me and people saying like, you shouldn't be out here at night girls, you know? And mm -hmm. um, so it's just ironic how things happen. And we had a guest on a while back, he, he was kidnapped and uh, his dad shot the guy mm -hmm. right when he brought him back on the, on, on new, on the news, the news, yeah. camera caught the news it. caught it. Yeah. Blew him dead right there. It's a crazy story. Uh, Jody <sighs> Ploche. Uh, how could I forget that? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually related to him by blood. <laughs> yeah, I didn't relatives. know the relation, but um, out of It's a Small World, I am related to him by blood. But uh, wow. yeah. He's oh, a positive, he's motivational guy now, too. He's, yeah, he, he's something. He was he's... kidnapped for two weeks yeah. and sexually assaulted the whole time. And, um, and it, when he, he got when he got back and then the kidnapper was extradited because he had taken him from louisiana to california when he was in the airport coming back the news cameras were there to video him walking through that the whole town knew about it and so they were there to video him and on camera the dad this was pre 9 11 remember when anyone could walk to the gate right and there were pay phones right there and he's pretending to or actually, I think he was on the phone He's with somebody. Phone. Yeah. And he turns around. There was no uh, 
it, you didn't have to have the metal detectors back then. So he turns around and he just pulls out a gun and shoots him in the head. Wow. Yeah. Was he charged? No. 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 The, the kidnapper had done that to, not kidnapped, but sexually assaulted some other boys in the town. And the whole town rallied around the dad saying like, he he just killed someone that was doing this to other kids too Brother. and would have continued to do this. <coughs> Shouldn't be wow. anything wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> Predator walking around hurting people. Yeah. I think wow. he ended up having to spend the night, like one night one in jail night. just so they could like figure out what to do, but they ended up letting him go. Wow, what a story. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But it, the point is, of course your dad felt like that. You know, that's a natural reaction. But I mean, we talked about it when we were interviewing Jody. Like, if someone did that to our kid, God rest their soul, because yeah. <laughs> Marcus would completely tear them apart. I mean, there's no way that- a, I'm gonna take my time with it. Yeah, that a parent would, would not want that to happen to the person. It's just a natural reaction that you would want the worst thing for them but the worst thing is nothing that we can do yeah god's gonna judge them and they will right. i mean i fully believe that there is hell and that's where your kidnapper will be for eternity and jody's kidnapper is for eternity and you know i'll tell you through my my healing process i did forgive him absolutely i learned so much about his life that he grew up with an abusive family and again never condones any crime but at the end of the day we do need more research to find out why especially these serial perpetrators do these crimes you know and so one of my scariest speeches ever i was in my early 20s and i spoke at the wisconsin department of corrections in front of a room full of repeat sex offenders which was so terrifying for me but what I found out was so many of these men had been traumatized as kids. So of course, not every person who goes through trauma is become, you know, gonna become a perpetrator. I am in no way saying that, but there are so many people that have been through trauma that you know, wind up committing these crimes. And so you know, we need to have better interventions for people that have been through you know, different experiences. And so you know, I, I really have come a long way in my journey in the beginning, it was, you know, really my sights were set on just locking everybody up. And I really believe there needs to be more rehabilitation. And, you know, I don't know, it's it's tough. It's one of the laws that we helped pass in Illinois. So right after this happened to me, I wanted to funnel my, my anger. One of the ways that I helped heal myself was to become an activist, an advocate for social change and for political change. And so we worked on this policy, myself, my family, the family of not only the girl that he had killed, Julie Angel's family, but other of his previous victims that I was able to meet through this process. And so with, uh, with the help of our community, we got these petitions signed and you know, here I am at 17, seeing that the people have the power to make a difference when they want to. There was a woman that was nine months pregnant outside on a hot sweltering Chicago summer day, getting signatures outside the grocery store on these petitions. People put on their medical office desks, the whole community rallied around this. And we were able to enact the Sexually Violent Persons Commitment Act, which basically shows that if a person has spent their time in prison and they have had you know, a lot of repeat crimes that they can be held in front of a panel of psychologists and psychiatrists and they can be held in a mental institution if they feel that they're still a threat to society. Yeah, that's awesome that y'all got that done. When, at what point did y'all find out that he had done it to other people? So I was in the midst of, so this was, oh, probably five days after I was kidnapped and I had my college placement exams which my mom's like, Angela, you don't have to go. And I said, but I want to, you know, I don't want to put my life on hold. What if they never catch this guy? I don't want to, you know, completely derail my life. So we wound up driving. It was about two and a half or three hours away at Illinois State. And I was in this huge lecture hall, taking my college placement exams, obviously traumatized, still a hot mess. But I, there was a woman that came in and said, Angela, you need to grab your things. You know, Angela Rose needs to grab her things. You know, so I brought my test up to the, the proctor at the front of the classroom and they had caught somebody. And so they told my parents very little, but we had to drive back. It was like the longest three hour drive. I joked that my dad was, you know, in the in the minivan going like a hundred miles an hour, the car <laughs> is shaking as we're driving. And it was so confusing. And we pull up 
to the police station and there was all these news crews, you know, all the, the TV cameras. And I was so confused with, you know, I had no idea it was for our case. And so they kind of brought me into a, a back door and I was, they said, you know, we, we have somebody in custody. We want to see if you can pick him out of the lineup. Let's take a second to thank our friends and sponsors over at Navy Federal Credit Union. When it comes to managing your money, it could be extremely stressful when it comes to investments and saving. And, you know, we're a few months into the new year. And if you had big plans to put some money away for a special occasion, a vacation, maybe just to invest for your future, then you know that sometimes you can fall short of those goals. But Navy Federal Credit Union takes the legwork out of saving and investments. They offer multiple savings products and investing options to help you get closer to those financial goals. And you can put your money to work by automating your savings and investments, take the stress out of it. Plus they offer educational resources to help guide your decisions. I want you guys to check it out. Learn more at navyfederal.org slash save and invest saving products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. Navyfederal.org slash save and invest. And of course, they're all wearing the same thing, all the orange jumpsuits. They all look the same, thick glasses. And I knew immediately which one he was. I said, number three, no question. And they said they kind of nodded in approval like, that's right, she's got it. And so they brought me into this room and the district attorney was there with the detectives and they said, Angela, you were right. This wasn't his first crime. He's on parole for murder. And I, I I think I punched a wall at that time. I was just, I had so much anger inside me, not just because of what happened to me, but the fact that I wasn't believed. And he was on the streets for five days before they, you know, really took this thing seriously. And I just, I felt so disempowered. Um, and so anyway, I just really wanted to do what I can to get my power back. And that was through community organizing and ultimately starting PAVE. And did they have, I don't remember, I mean, I'm the same age as you, cause 96, I was a senior too. So, um, oh. Did they have DNA back then? I don't remember at what year that, like, through the police <clears throat> force to catch They people. did. So they didn't take my clothes for evidence. They didn't take anything um, the night that I was kidnapped. So they weren't able to use any DNA, but they were able to use the, the you know, all the other evidence. Um, yeah. So in the um, bodily they, harm charge was where he had bound my hands behind my back. So we were hoping that we would, you know, be able to... You know, and it's interesting when you go through and you talk to the DA, all the different charges. So it's not just one crime. You know, there's multiple different crimes that people are charged with for something like this. It's, you know, bodily harm and um, aggravated kidnapping and all these different things. But most of the time, I do want to say most of the time when people go through sexual trauma, there is no weapon. You know, it's usually trying to, you know, there's a lot of grooming with trust. If it's a date or acquaintance, a teacher, a coach, it's usually somebody that's known to us. Yeah. So my parents always taught me to, you know, obviously the stranger danger. And of course that happened to me. So it does happen, but it's such a small amount of time. You know, most of the time it's somebody that we know and we trust. And I think that's very important for all the listeners to understand that when we're talking to our children, it's really to follow that gut instinct. And for us, we're very passionate about teaching consent. We have a, a really amazing high school program. I was so blessed to be able to speak at the White House Summit for Women and Girls about our high school program that engages boys and girls about healthy relationships. I don't think people want to be talking about against, like we're not against sexual violence. We're pro-consent, pro-healthy relationships, pro-bystander intervention. I think people want to have something to model too. So I'm really passionate about that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's crazy. I wonder if like through time, if they ended up doing his DNA and matching it to other people that y'all didn't even know about at that time. Well, it could be his M.O. is so unique with the, the kidnapping, the changing of the clothes. I mean, he's done that to all of his victims. Um, actually, it was one of the first cases I found out that DNA evidence was used back in 1980 when he was convicted for the murder of Julie Angel. She went missing. She was coming home. It was a really cold Chicago day and she was coming home. And she's not the kind of girl to run away, though the police back in 1980 tried to convince Julie's mom and sister that she was just a runaway. And they said, that is not like her. And so for many days, they put all these posters all over. And there was a young woman named Deborah Mullaney, who again in 1980, would always walk the same route home from work. And he tried to kidnap her once, he put a knife to her throat, but he heard people coming, so he let her go. 
She filed the police report, started taking the bus home, and two weeks later, he got Deborah again when oh she was gosh. leaving her bus stop. And so that time, he actually did kidnap her. And her story is so inspirational. I love Deborah. She is she was such a support to me and such an inspiration that he, you know, put the knife to her throat and, and he had her hand his hand on her head and she was crouched down in the front, the passenger seat, and she kept saying, "I'm going to be sick. You need to let me go." He pulls over to the side of the road to walks around the car to let her out. She jumps up into the driver's seat, has never driven stick shift, but learned very fast in that moment and got away with his car, <gasps> with his driver's license. And that's how they caught him for Julie Angel's murder because they that was the first case in Illinois that they linked fiber samples from the trunk of the car to fiber samples on her body. Oh so she was able to gosh. bring him to justice through her bravery. That's a good one. That is crazy. <clears throat> And they all came, you know, through the court, the court process. It's just amazing how many, you know, you think you just don't know it when you don't have any experience with the criminal justice system. But it was every couple of months there was different motions for different things. And I had such an incredible support network. You know, Deborah came, other of his previous victims came. Julie's mom was by my side the whole time. And he was sentenced to life in prison. It was either on her birthday or a day before her birthday, but it was her birthday week that he was sentenced to life in prison. That's crazy. You're definitely a powerful woman. Yeah. For sure. I mean, someone that just to, to, to recall that. Oh, a lot of times when we go through trauma, the the fear overtakes you. Yeah. Right. And the, even driving to the police station when he's behind bars, you're thinking like, oh, he's still a predator kind of deal. In reality, he's scared to death in that in that prison, everything like that. I mean, you you have the power that immediately as soon as it's over, it's, like, it's just a matter of feeling that and then talking about it too helps Absolutely. when you're saying you got a, a great support a system PTSD like I'm sure you can relate to this right it's like our bodies think that something's a threat when it's not yeah you know you're something and it brings you back to feeling powerless and so you know I'd walk with my hand over my throat when I went away to college I would always feel like somebody was behind me but I never realized that it was because of the kidnapping it's like when you're in it you can't see it right, right? And so I did a treatment called EMDR, which was eye movement desensitization and reprocessing to help with the PTSD. And it just, oh, I didn't even know this boulder was on my chest until I did this treatment and I just felt so free. Yeah. That's so it. did a profiler ever talk to you about, like walk you through and even though you couldn't get answers from him, but have like a profiler just say, this is probably what happened like why he wanted you in a dress like did he have this horrific prom night experience or something you know i would think right, that's what like, i want to know inquiring yeah. minds want to know you know so yeah. no I, I would be very interested in that and he's still alive i mean he's old now but you know maybe you know maybe he'd be open to a conversation you know my husband thinks that's the worst idea in the world but uh, oh i would be so curious like what happened to you that was so bad. I mean, in my mind, I'm just thinking his prom night completely humiliated him or something. Something happened where some girl he was with was in a fancy dress and something extremely fucked up happened to where right. he just lost it and needs to control girls in this way, whether it matters their life or not. So, oh yeah, if it's definitely it's all the same color, same dress, yeah. it's all it's that's. I mean, I mean, Something we've seen like enough Law and Orders and, and all those <laughs> freaking know that's going down, right? Plus, I've guys, too much I mean, TV. yeah. Right? But well, what I found out later, and this was not, this is something I found out very recently, as I've been working on my second book. The first book that I wrote is really just a guidebook for overcoming any adversity. It's not my story. It's just a really tangible guidebook of how to overcome adversity and to live a happy, joyful life. But the second book is, you know, the memoir of the experience. So I interviewed the DA actually this last summer and I didn't know this, but he built a closet behind his closet that had all of these dresses and things in there, which is again, so creepy. Oh um, but, you know, he married this beautiful 20 year old. He was probably 50 and his uh, Japanese immigrant wife was 20 years old. And so when she answered the door for them to come and search the house, I just, I felt so sorry for her. She had no idea. Uh, I've actually tried to, to find her, but she fled back to Japan after this happened. But I would love to know, you know, what was, what was their relationship like? It's just interesting to think about. Yeah, I would be so interested in that. Like, not 
to excuse any of his behavior, but what, how do you prevent that from happening again? You know, like if somebody, that's like when people, when I watch those Law and Order-ish kind of TV shows, I'm, it's not because I'm obsessed with the crime, it's because I want to know how to spot someone that is going to do something like that. You know, right. like I want to be able to psychologi psychologically profile someone and help them before That's they do right. something bad. Um, not that I can do anything, but um, it's just, it's so interesting. Well, no, you know, I mean, I, they, they, like you said, it looked like that. I mean, God has a wonderful way of wrapping people in what they're, what you're looking at. And if it's a jungle out there and there, there's predators out there. Right. And I'll say, you know, on college campuses, we do a lot of work on college campuses and in high schools. And like a lot of times they look like a star athlete. They yeah. look very, you know, charismatic. So, you know, looks can be extremely deceiving sometimes because like some Bundy. of these predators. Ted, Bundy, Ted Bundy was yeah. like a very Good handsome example. man that, you know, the college girls wanted him to, wanted them to pick him up. But um, he was he was a serial killer. Freak. Right. Good example. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. So you started PAVE pretty quickly after everything. It was like two years later, right? Yeah, a couple years later. So I went away to college and it, again, it took four years for my case to come to trial. And my DA was just like, listen, you just need to go away to school. I wound up staying close to home. I didn't go away to Illinois State because of all the pretrial motions. It was just so much, you know, it just been too much. Um, and I did not want to let my parents handle that. And my grandparents, by the way, they were in the front row. We called them the senior brigade because it was my grandma, <laughs> my grandpa, and all their senior friends came to every court hearing, which was just amazing. Uh, so that was so amazing. So yeah, I went away to University of Wisconsin-Madison just a couple of years after I was kidnapped and I looked for a group like PAVE to join. I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. I really wanted to just, you know, be involved and, and there wasn't anything. So I took months researching what's the missing piece, you know? And so what we found out what was missing was an organization that took a very positive and proactive approach. We did a lot of work with fraternity men on campus to educate about consent, healthy relationships, the bystander intervention, how to support survivors. We did a lot of work on campus to raise awareness about these issues, to celebrate survivors' voices. And what really struck me was how many male survivors disclosed to me along this journey. And so I realized very early on when I started PAVE that this is not a women's issue. Mm -hmm. This impacts all gender identities. This is something where, you know, so many men would disclose to me saying, you know, this happened, but I've never told anybody. And I kept hearing, I've never told anybody. And that's why our motto was shattering the silence of sexual violence, because so many people would suffer in silence for years. And well-meaning loved ones oftentimes don't know how how to react. So oftentimes our, our parents, our loved ones, our partners, our lovers say very victim blaming things inadvertently that make us, you know, not want to talk about it ever again. So we do a lot of training also with parents, with teachers, with lovers on, on what to say or do if somebody discloses. And that's really important. Hey, let's take a second to thank our sponsors over at BattleBox. How are you gonna find your new favorite piece of outdoor gear? Well, if you sign up for a BattleBox membership, it will find you. Seriously, this is one of my all-time favorite products. I'm not just saying that because they're a sponsor. I'm a real huge fan. I was actually telling my girlfriend that when it comes to shopping for me, it can be kind of difficult, but with BattleBox, I get the coolest products every month sent to me and there's incredible things, whether it's outdoor gear, survival gear, and even everyday carry gear. BattleBox is your go-to monthly subscription. Getting the best gear for yourself not only takes time, but it can be incredibly expensive and that is why BattleBox brings you name brand, high quality products every month at half the price of what they'd cost on their own. Just pick the box that works for you and get tested and vetted products you can trust that are selected by an expert team of outdoor professionals from an Aquapod emergency water kit to an Atomic Bear survival bivy delivered right to your doorstep. BattleBox has shipped over 1 million boxes since 2015. 1 million boxes. That says something, all right? And they have been featured everywhere from the New York Times to Survivor's Edge. And I was super pumped when I got my first box. It had a Nikron USB chargeable 1200 lumen flashlight. That thing is incredible. It came with a solo stove, which are really good for like your little solo stove pots if you wanted to make coffee or soup while you're out camping. And it's really lightweight, fits into your bag. It came with a Survivor Filter Pro Pump, which actually allows you to kind of filter, I guess, unclean water to be using while you're camping and out there surviving. I mean, this box had a lot of stuff in it and every single piece of gear I 
I have a purpose for. It even came with one of the coolest knives that's in my collection. So if you're looking to find your best piece of outdoor gear, your best survival gear, your best everyday carry item, then look no further than BattleBox. Find out why outdoor enthusiasts call BattleBox the best gear I never knew I wanted. Sign up, receive, survive. What are you guys waiting for? Don't miss another BattleBox mission. From now until March 31st, you're going to get a free mystery box worth $115 plus dollars with any new subscription. That is trybattlebox.com slash TNQ. That is a free mystery box worth $115 plus dollars right now. T-R-Y-B-A-T-T-L box.com slash TNQ. Trybattlebox.com slash TNQ and check out the coolest gear on the planet. It's been it's been quite a journey. I moved to DC, um, spent ten years there. Did a, I think what's interesting about the issue I think of sexual violence is that it is truly a bipartisan issue. We had a lot of bipartisan support on all the bills that we worked on. You know, I think that everybody can agree on safe families, safe schools, safe communities. So I helped to support the launch of the very first bipartisan task force to uh, end sexual violence in Congress. You know, it's just it's been an amazing, amazing journey. And so working with the State it, Department doing it, it didn't bring that up. Right. And Congress, sexual violence in Congress, that's supposed to be our leaders. Right. That's right. I mean, how's that even come up in conversation? You know, what I'm talking that's about right. and, <laughs> and the sexual I, harassment piece, people don't realize like how, you know, so we do sexual harassment training as well. I mean, obviously, there's varying degrees of sexual trauma, but it, it can you know, positions of power, looking at the power hierarchy of a lot of times yeah. how people pray. And it's, it's, it's been a journey. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, when you, not to go back too far back into your story, but when you first went to the police station, so when he dropped you off at the stairwell, how did you get, like, how did you leave that moment? So again, I, I tried to take those bindings off or, you know, those um, band-aids and sunglasses off my face. And when I heard the car pull away, I knew it was too late to catch his license plate. So honestly, for a lot of people that have been through trauma and Marcus, I don't know if you can attest to this, but so often when you go through trauma, it's almost like an out of body experience. And so like at that moment, it's like everything came full circle that I was there at that moment. You know, it's, it's almost like you're looking down on yourself sometimes when you go through traumatic experiences and in that stairwell, it's like something just popped and it's like, wow, like that five hours literally happened. I am here, I am safe. And I wanted to call mall security. My plan was to call mall security to drive me back to my car so I could go home and call the police. And I remember walking down the stairwell and I found myself in an, an auto sh like an auto repair shop and so I think it was like a Sears you know the auto repair shop inside of Sears and I remember the guy was on the phone and he looked up and his face just fell and he said oh my god what happened to you I mean mascara was all over my face my clothes were, I was a mess and so he called the police right away and uh, then I had to make the hardest call ever which was to my Italian father my mom was at a party down in the city and that was before cell phones so I had no way to call my mom so my dad was with the girls with my sisters and so I had to call him and he's the one that met me at the police station and he was amazing. And um, what was so difficult for my parents that night is they kind of kept me in this questioning room and my parents, my mom, especially when she got back from that party, they were able to call the restaurant that she was at. She came home right away and her and my dad were at the police station waiting to see me and they wouldn't let my mom see me. And they were like threatening my parents, like you need to calm down and you need to, or we're gonna kick you out of here. My mom's like, I'm not the criminal here. I just wanna see my daughter. She's only 17. I just wanna see her face that she's okay. And they, they wouldn't let her see me. And so just the whole reporting process that night was very, very difficult. They had to call a detective in and his arms were crossed. And the one thing I talk about also in my law enforcement training is the importance of body language. Yeah. You know, you can say one thing in a different tone with different body language and it's a completely different meaning, right? So oh, he sure. comes in with his arms crossed, looks at me and says, I'm not even supposed to be working tonight because I'm going to the Olympics tomorrow. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. cool. So like, fine. So he tells me this, you know, he's like, well, tell me what happened to you. So I tell him the story in excruciating detail. And that was the other thing that's so hard. It's like, you know, there's a lot of children advocacy centers where oftentimes survivors that are under 18 only have to tell their story once and it's videotaped. And so, because when you have to tell it over and over again, obviously it's re-traumatizing. So I told him this, the same story. I told these other police officers 
told the detective everything, you know, excruciating detail by excruciating detail. And he stops and he looks at me and he says, I need to ask you a question that I ask every victim that comes in here. Are you lying? Oh and my I said, God. no. He said, are you in an abusive relationship? Does your boyfriend hit you? Because sometimes girls get themselves into situations. Nothing was done on my case that night. He didn't believe me at all. And I remember just clenching my fists and just like walking out and just going home that night. And, and I guess in the file, he wrote something like they didn't think it was a credible story. And he's like, oh, the other thing he said is, it's not like somebody's MO to just let you go, Angela. Like, oh, sorry, he didn't kill me. I mean, it was just so outrageous. And um, and I remember sleeping that night at my parents that like on the floor at the foot of their bed, because it was just such a crazy experience. And so I was, you know, laying at the on the floor of their bed and, um, you know, just waking up. And I remember that morning hearing my mom on the phone downstairs telling my aunt that I had gotten into a really bad car accident. And I, I kind of walked down the stairs and I whispered, I said, Mom, why are you lying? And she was like, I don't know, but it's everybody's first reaction to like not talk about it because it's so embarrassing. You know, when you talk about sexual assault, it's like such an embarrassing thing. And we're really trying to remove that shame because that's not my fault. You right. know, it's not the survivor's fault that we've gone through that. No. So, you know, she's, her and my dad have just been such amazing parents. And my dad passed away a couple of years before our wedding or a couple of months rather um, before we got married. And so for me, I just, you know, I thanked him just for being so supportive and, um, yeah, I think of death very differently now. Having lost my grandma, my dad, my two greatest supporters through my journey and being there for their last breaths has just been such an amazing experience. And um, yeah, I think about death differently now. Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. Oh, when it, when she comes around, it's different. Like most, you, you check on board here. When you're born, you learn how to live while you're dying. Because I mean, right. you take the first breath, then you, you extinguish it. If you ever run into her while you're going through your life, you'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. ever I wake up that's right and I wake up every morning literally thanking God for another day and that's why you know with everything going on in the world right now there's so much unrest uh, you know the threat of nuclear war there's just so much going on I said just live for this moment because no matter what happens whether it be nuclear war you get hit by a bus you have a giant heart attack whatever it is this is the only moment that we have so enjoy it yeah for sure thank you for sharing your story that is so crazy and I think back in in that time, pre-cell phone, um, which we didn't know cell phones were coming, but I remember having that fear. And I don't know if it was all the 80s kidnapping movies that were going on. <laughs> I felt like there was a lot. Um, or the serial killer stories from the 80s. But um, I always had a fear of being kidnapped. Like, if you would have asked me when I was in high school what my biggest fear was, it was to be kidnapped, oh, even wow. though never happened thank god um i think a lot of people our age were scared of that um and to hear your story and knowing that we're the same age just i was able to put myself you know back in that time frame and think right. about that and it's it's terrifying you lived most girls our age's worst nightmare We are supported by Happy. Wouldn't it be great if choosing how you feel was as easy as picking a song on your phone? You could tap a button to feel energized without any caffeine. You could tap a button to feel relaxed when you're stressed out. When I heard that there was a wearable device called Happy that lets you change how you feel, I couldn't believe it, so I gave it a try. Happy works by delivering signals to give you the same sensation as caffeine or alcohol or even melatonin without any of the chemicals or side effects, and the signals are a song only your body can hear. They're made by Happy to replicate the unique magnetic signatures of popular everyday ingredients. Just by switching the signal on your phone, you can change how you feel. That is crazy. <laughs> I love using the happy device to be able to boost my energy, to give me that little focus I need, that productivity shot that I need to get me through the day without all the crazy side effects of the chemicals. That That's just not what I wanted. And happy is backed by decades of research and it even has a 365 day guarantee so you can try it for a whole year. And if you don't think it works, you can send it back. Give happy a try and you're going to love it as much as I do. Order today and you'll save 25% and you're going to get 90 days of free access to all their signals. Take advantage of their 365 day guarantee today. Go to happy.com slash TNQ. That is H A P B E E.com slash TNQ. And you're going to save 25% on your order. Happy.com slash TNQ. Well, 
Madeline, the police said to me 90% of young victims that go into the car of a serial perpetrator, especially who's on parole for murder, like they don't make it out. Right. So I, I literally thank God every single day for another day on this planet because, you know, tomorrow's promised to none of us. And so, you know, just really enjoying every single moment as much as we can. I don't, you know, I really try not to sweat the small stuff. I've done a lot of healing work that I like to, you know, one of the things I also do with law enforcement, not just talking about inside the mind of the survivor, but I'm also very passionate about teaching healthy coping mechanisms of how to overcome trauma and self-care to first responders to military you know there's just so many little tricks that we can use to take control of our minds when it starts to spin out and i'm really passionate about that oh well those that's great because those are needed it, it's amazing how it's it's the little things what you just talked about like when you i heard the other day i've gotten to the point in my life where when if i see anybody walking around with some snow you know white or gray up top i'm like hey man give me some wisdom i know you got it <laughs> It's usually short to the point and save you about 15 years of pain. That's right. You know what I'm talking about? It's like that. It, it, when the lady the other day, she was like, don't sweat the small stuff because it's all small stuff. I use the redneck version of it. It's like, don't sweat the petty stuff and don't pet the sweaty stuff. But it's the same <laughs> thing, right? It's almost as if every, every ounce of everything that we have to go through is designed to, for a teaching moment. And you know, a lot of times when we're studying or we're going through the test or, and, and the and they are extreme in some some cases. I mean, you're one of them, right? You don't get battle weakened, you get battle hardened. But it, it takes a while to get get back up on pace and see where you're going with that. You never look back. Mm -hmm. That in itself is is amazing. I mean, your strength, you can't believe it. I appreciate it. that, but it literally, it's support means everything. And so for anybody listening, if anybody discloses, there's so much information on our website of what to say or do, but let me just arm you with this. If somebody that you love discloses to you, always believe them. Really be aware not to use victim blaming language. Like, well, what were you wearing? So many people ask me what I was wearing. It's like, if I was, I was wearing a pantsuit, but if I was wearing a red mini skirt, should that make a difference? Right. Absolutely not. But so many people are asked, what were they wearing? How much did they have to drink? You know, so many questions that blame the survivor. So be very aware not to use language that blames the victim and just really be a listening ear. I think it's so important for people to understand a lot. You know, I didn't change as a person. I was still me, but like I lost my very best friend in high school. She didn't know how to, to handle it or to deal with it. And she just completely stopped talking to me. And that was really hard because, you know, I still felt like I was me, but we don't have a course on how to deal with these things. So we rekindled our friendship years later, but you know, in a time where I really needed her the most, she wasn't there and I don't blame her. You know, people don't know how to deal with traumatic situations. So um, so I'm really excited to be going more into high schools with our paved programming to not only teach how to just, you know, support somebody that discloses, but also how to rise above traumatic situations. Everybody has adversity in their life. And so, you know, that's something I'm really passionate about. So what, what's the name of your both of your books? So the first book is called Hope, Healing, and Happiness, Going Inward to Transform Your Life. Very tangible, concrete steps on how to overcome any adversity. And uh, the second book is going to be called Bound and Beyond. That's your memoir? That's the memoir, yeah. And it's been really interesting just interviewing people, even interviewing my mom, you know, uh, it was very hard. And now that I'm a mother, I completely understand. But for her, like that was the day that I was truly my spiritual awakening. As I mentioned to you all, that was, you know, I, I heard God's voice. I felt the presence of God in that car. That was my spiritual awakening. And for her, somebody who went to Catholic school, that was the day that she said she lost her faith mm. because she said, how could I have this happen to me when, you know, I've been such a, you know, devout believer my whole life. And I said, but mom, I'm here. You know, yeah. it's like, I'm still here. And although, and this may sound strange to you all, but I would never wish what happened to me on anybody, but I would never change it. Yeah. Because for me in that experience in my life, I learned an inner strength that I never knew existed. I became a kinder human being. I learned, you know, skills to help other people. So I would never change this terrible experience in my life. Yeah. We say we don't have bad ones, we just have hard ones, right? It's whatever <laughs> right. you're going through, just kind of, it's, it's, it's almost like how diamonds are formed. I mean, it's through pressure. You know, the, the, the more pressure there, the more precious the, the diamond, right? And when that thing finally breaks out of there and you, you see it shining, it's impactful. Can't hear, you can't stop staring at it. 
It's a I mean, it's, it's you know what I'm talking about. It's just like one of them deals where I I wouldn't even have paid attention to it till you till whatever it was that created it kind of catches your attention and then you look at it and and man you you're a perfect example of that. So never stop shining for sure. Because I imagine every time you go out and talk to somebody, it teaches you something about yourself. I mean, every time that you probably did know, but you didn't know how to say it that way. And the people right. that you I miss all the in-person trainings. I just love giving hugs every time I speak at an event. I'd say, you know, and just to let you know if anybody wants a hug, and I just would get a line of people that just want to, you know, just an embrace. And I have had so many people disclose to me their stories for the first time. I mean, what a gift for me to be able to hear countless stories from people that feel comfortable enough to share with me their scariest experience or their most vulnerable. And I, I really. Um, oh yeah, you know, that comes with it. Make sure you put that in the book. Because there is a level of, of or a degree that w when you go through something, it automatically drops everybody's shields. Yes. And they'll, they'll, they'll come in there and tell you their worst day. I'll sit there and people come up just delivering message to, messages to me. And I'm like, man, I don't know if you, uh, all right, I'll listen. <laughs> right? It's because, they get, man, whatever it is we went through, we can take it. It gives them hope. That's right. Right? And especially since right. you do it with a smile on your face. You know, I normally don't have a smile on my face. I'm, I'm kind of... <laughs> But there's always angels around, right? So I mean, it's it's one of them deals where you, yeah, you hear that story and it's like, man, because especially, man, I don't like it when women get hurt. Mm -hmm. I don't like that at all, right? So, but when you, even in my capacity, which I, I like, I rage over here right now, over here, and you say, I'm in a moral conundrum because you're happy about it. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Like you've turned it into something to where I, I it doesn't compute in my head. Like I'm really wanting to go tear that 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 side of me exists, right? Yeah. But then you understand what you are, and like man, the only way you would have gotten that 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 ability is if you had to go through that. And I don't know if there's a calmness or a peace in that. There's a, definitely a just thank you for being well, you. Thank That's you. All I, can say, I think man. it's all about finding God's purpose. Like there's so much joy in really feeling like you're on purpose. And that's why, you know, with your podcast, humanity needs this right now. You know, we need to really come together and unify to understand that we are all human beings. And I, I feel like, you know, with this time and space in our nation's history, we need to come together. We need to support each other. We need to give each other's tools on how to rise above any adversity that you have in your life covid and now with everything happening overseas but especially just with the covid situation there has been so many people that are stuck with abusers i mean the, the amount of domestic violence and sexual abuse that has happened in the last you know two years has been more than we've ever seen the calls to hotlines are up and so what we did at pave is we really tried to to combat that we created a groundbreaking new resource for survivors for any of your listeners it's survivors.org groundbreaking resource with 1300 local partners across the country to help people in these situations of human trafficking domestic violence sexual abuse child abuse and we also have these really beautiful holistic healing techniques that people can do in their own home because a lot of that is just reconnecting to your body because when something happens to you you know, especially with sexual violence, your body autonomy, it's its just, it's really hard for people to learn how to, to be comfortable in their own skin again. So we have some really beautiful tools. on. How oh, to sure. That. Uh, bad situations or violence separate your mind and body and yes. your spirit. Actually, if you're young, yes. if you don't know how those work and if you haven't conditioned yourself to work together, well, we'll shut that thing off. That's right. And you'll, you'll feel the gap is like running an engine and there's a, it, it, it'll stall for a second. But, and you can, I'm sure, personally attest to that mm. with everything that you've been through. <laughs> Hadn't it been a ride? Come on, girl. You know, it's been one hell of a ride, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I've been long suffering. Someone's down here, just do that. Yeah. The minute I try to get myself into a position where I don't have to feel any pain, I feel more. Yes. It you took me forever to, to man, every time I try to get to a spot where I don't have to feel any pain or pressure, it hits me, it finds a way. Right. It's almost as if life keeps the pressure off of me. It, it's a reverse. Ma I don't know how it, how it happened, but if I'm not out there in the grind, it, it'll come to me. <laughs> so never stop grinding. I have one Imagine more question you were, you about your... cut from the same cloth. Sorry. One more question about your story. Did your mom ever come back with her faith? Did she ever circle she did. back? Yes, okay. actually, it was very bonding. Even this last Ash Wednesday, we all went to mass together oh. for the first time. And, um, you know, it just it's been a journey and i i tell my parents every day i well 
my dad to you, even though he's in heaven. I, I always, you know, just thank them so much for their support. Cause I know that I would not be where I am without their support. All right, so you're well, a Catholic. I, yeah. <laughs> I grew up Catholic, that changes yeah. everything. All right. Now, damn it, girl, you're a warrior then. I didn't know that. I knew just from her being Italian That changes in everything. I kind of catch it. I was like, all right, that makes sense. I should have picked that up. Well, good job, warrior. Marcus is well, converting you. right I now. I will say it's been a struggle with my Catholic faith. <laughs> oh, I man, I bet. Dude, I tell you what. I, right? It does. But when you, look, like, if you got, you see it from my angle. I mean, like, warrior, it's, that's what that is. Like, if you're inside of it, you can't see that. Even if you're going into the war. Well. But from the, from the outside coming back in, it's like, I'll recognize you quick. You're the ones that's supposed to armor up. That's how you get the, all that. Every time you go through one of those, man, it's like pounding, like drilling it into you. You know, don't, you can feel it. And anytime that fear comes on there, you just pop that head up, look exactly what's coming at and just push back. Because your job is not to not take that in. It's to push it not only out of you, but out of whatever it is that's bringing that in there. Mm. And I, you know, I did, that, that makes complete sense to me now. Well, I then think you, it's you, a God thing that the last several... <laughs> People we've interviewed are Catholic, and Marcus is converting right now, so he gets baptized and confirmed on Easter, Easter vigil. So um, it, it's just it's a complete coincidence or God thing that um, y'all said y'all been hiding all this stuff for about two thousand <laughs> years. No one knew about it. It's not funny. But, I mean, like you learn about some of this stuff and coming in, man, it helps. I didn't know that. I was out there getting my ass kicked, not knowing what was going down. If you understand you're getting your butt kicked for a reason, then it makes everything all right. Yeah. You don't, I, I mean, people think that's funny. I didn't think getting my ass kicked my whole <laughs> life was funny for, for, I didn't know what was happening, but now I do. So, yeah. <laughs> so Marcus, with everything that you went through, did faith help you overcome this, you know, the adversity that you went through? It was reversed for me. You said your, your, your people you surround yourself with, my friends are the most important thing to me. That's why they killed every one of them around me. Hmm. That's what I looked to more than God was my friends. So because of that, they get pulled from me. I mean, I still hear them all the time. Don't worry. They're right here. I can't, I can't get away from them. It's disturbing sometimes. But anyways, when you go back in and you, and you realize, all right, well, that was for a reason. That's all you have to say to somebody. Like, man, you had to go through that for a reason. And so everybody, well, first of all, we all draw our own weight. Like you, you picked that before you got down here. Cause you said you was the one that could handle it. Not only handle it, you're the one that can deliver the message that's going to be all right. The trick is you not knowing that there is, there's a, there's a, a wall, a veil or a blindness or something that happens. Right. And it's kind of like, if no one's there helping you, if you don't have faith or guidance, I almost talk about it like learning a martial art from a book or a TV show. I, I kind of had an idea of what it was all about until I walked into the, into the school and there was somebody in there that could actually teach me how to do it. Because we're a mind, body, and spirit. You hear that all the time. Mind, but there are three different things. Mm -hmm. Some people are born into this world. They're body people. They go to the gym. They work outside. They play outside. Some people are spirits. They go to church their whole life. And then some people are mind people. They go to school. They study. You usually don't have all three of those in one. But if you know how important it is to train your body and what that does to you, just to think it does the same thing for the mind, same thing for the spirit. So if you leave one of those out, there's a gap. But... As you go through life, you put them together and then life runs that cycle for you. Well, then that's, that's an unstoppable force because you're down here to learn. You're down here to earn your heart. That's earth and heart. I like to say it's the same word. Just move one of those letters around, right? So you're down here trying to figure that thing out. There's more receptors running from the heart to the brain. There is back down. It's like a tail and a dog. That sucker feels things differently. feels love differently. It hurts by itself when the body's not hurting, right? And the only way to train that thing is life. And man, I didn't know anything about that. She broke it down for me. She had to say it in my language. And once I heard it, I was like, well, I understand exactly what you're saying. Not only that, I can tell you backwards. It, it, where, you know, it makes sense to both of us. That's the cool part about it. Well, so I when I see somebody like you, man, that good, hey, warrior, mm -hmm. <laughs> nice work. I think Marcus always knew that, that God exists. He knew that God was with him but didn't know why he didn't know the purpose and didn't feel the Holy Spirit with him. And that is something that, I mean, how, for how many years afterwards he's, it's taken this long for that to connect and, and it's still a healing process. Now, some so, people get it early. Yeah. You know, I talk to the cradle sometime they're born into it. They don't have any idea what they got. <laughs> 
they never left the cradle. I was yeah. like, I, nothing wrong. I mean, that's, I'm not picking on you. That's just a thing. I mean, you yeah. can say whatever you want, but that's a fact. I was like, there's a thing in our, our religion called Mr. Gogi. All right, I knew what that word was before I even got in there. That means you get sent out yeah. away from the house. You get beat down. <laughs> so you could have some stories when you come back in. Like, who's got the best one? Yeah. Who went through it? Me and you are going to be sitting there for sure. Okay. Right? But it sounds like, hey, well, you guys got some stories. Like, hey, you go first, girl. <laughs> right? And that's, that's how I could feel that. And then when you say it to other people, they do too. That's how you know it's real. If I say something that's totally off the wall, it didn't make sense, and you know, that's not a thing. But if you, if you sit there smiling and feeling, I'm like, okay, that's what that is. I'm like, you're damn right it is. Because one person has the answer that the other one doesn't. It's just a matter of life putting us together. Universe has a funny way of making you wind up right at the right moment to hear something you needed to hear. Just, I mean, at the last minute too. It is, that's the way it works with me. I mean, I'll be beat down to nothing. And then somebody like you will walk in and be like, oh, it's this. I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> Training, obviously, for that. Just to give me that one little spell in my ear that I can hear to make everything all right. So, bless Divine you. Divine timing all the time. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you again for sharing your story. Uh, I hope we stay in touch and maybe we can get you out to our kids' school or something. Um, oh, I would love that. Yeah. No, thank you all. I mean, what an inspiration you are, Marcus, both of you. Thank you so much for having me on and for just helping us to spread the awareness because there's so many of your listeners who've experienced this. So just remember that no matter what happens in your life, it is not your fault and that a happy, joyful life is absolutely possible after trauma. Thank you so much. What What's your Amen. socials? How can people find you? So our socials are at PaveInfo. That's on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at PaveInfo. And uh, our website is shatteringthesilence.org. And if anybody needs support, our new resource is survivors.org. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. Appreciate you. God bless you. You too.